Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. Had a whole bunch of people send me a story about a case out of Iowa that is so interesting. I printed off the opinion from the Iowa Supreme Court. I have that here in front of me. And it has to do with FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act, or at least the concept. They call it the Open Records Act there. But the idea that you can contact somebody in the government and say, I'd like to see certain documents or information that you've got on something. And generally speaking, those records are available to you. Uh, there are some exceptions. Obviously, you can't get like state secrets and things like that. But generally speaking, the work of the government's being done on your behalf with your tax dollars, so you have the right to see that work product, right? Well, it turns out there's some problems in Iowa if you request those documents from the governor. Because it turns out that the governor and or the governor's office might not respond to you until you file a lawsuit. And then when you file the lawsuit, they might show up in court and say, well, we just turned the stuff over yesterday. Now that we've turned it over, this lawsuit should be dismissed. And the argument is, of course, if you force people to file the lawsuits before you respond, all you're doing is clogging up the courts and wasting everyone's time. Besides that, the law says you've got to comply. You can't just decide not to comply. And the argument they're making is, well, we, we did comply. We just didn't comply as quickly as they would have liked. And the Iowa Supreme Court says that's not how it works. And so we see a good ruling here from the Iowa Supreme Court in a case called Beelin versus the Governor. And there's a bunch of other people on both sides of that V, which I will explain. But this is an appeal from the lower court. The governor of Iowa, her office, and some of her staff seek interlocutory review of the district court's refusal to dismiss these lawsuits. And you should know that interlocutory review is a review, uh, an appeal taken before the usual time for an appeal. So generally speaking, if I'm involved in a case, case ends, and I think that the lower court screwed it up, I can appeal to a higher court. If, however, there's a screw-up during the proceedings that I think is so important that it needs to be corrected now, I can tell the court I'm taking an interlocutory review. Court may or may not care. But then you then ask the higher court, can you hear this as an interlocutory matter despite the fact the lower court has not ruled yet on the entire matter? And a higher court can say yes or a higher court can say no. They're a little bit unusual in that sense, um, but they are taken from time to time. So the governor here brought the interlocutory review and did not get the uh, answer that the governor would have liked. So this is the opinion of the court. It's about 23 pages long, so I'll do my best to summarize. But the Iowa General Assembly has determined that free and open examination of public records is generally in the public interest. And that's what the code says. And the code, of course, is Iowa's Open Records Act. The act provides a relatively simple process for citizens to request public records from government entities. And with limited exceptions, the act requires those entities to honor the requests by providing the requested records. If an entity refuses, the requesting citizen may file a lawsuit. That's, that is so straightforward. <laughs> this case, however, is about when the records must be produced. In 2020 and 21, the plaintiffs requested public records from the defendants. In December of 21, the plaintiffs filed this suit under the Open Records Act. Then in January, the defendants provided responsive records. Because they've now produced responsive records, the defendants contend they are no longer subject to lawsuit. Plaintiffs respond that the defendants violated the act through their delays, that is, the time it took between the requests and the production. Plaintiffs say those gaps range from 5 to 18 months, a year and a half to respond to a records request. Court concludes the act may permit the plaintiffs to pursue claims based on untimeliness. The district court was right to deny the defendant's motion to dismiss. We remand for further proceedings consistent with this opinion. So by way of background, the plaintiffs are three journalists, two news organizations, and a nonprofit. The defendants are the governor, three members of the governor's staff, and a government entity, which is the office of the governor of the state of Iowa. Plaintiffs allege that emailed eight different open record requests to the defendants, and apparently that's one way you can do this. Each request covered a different topic. The first request was sent April 20. The last request was sent April 21. Each of the eight requests was renewed at least once, and by that they mean that follow-up emails were sent saying, hey, what's going on here? In December of 21, the plaintiffs commenced this action by filing a petition in district court, alleging the defendants had violated the Open Records Act by failing to provide the requested records. They also alleged that even if defendants were to provide the requested records after the filing of the suit, Defendants had already violated it by failing to provide the records promptly and timely. 
As a result, plaintiffs sought mandamus, declaratory judgment, injunctive relief, court costs, and attorney fees. And the defendants filed a motion to dismiss because they argued that this is now moot because they've received the requested records. What they're saying is that as long as we get them the records, it doesn't matter when. And so if they file the lawsuit and we're in court and we turn the records over now, the case should just get dismissed. And again, following that logic, the courts would just get clogged up by people who are following up on this, and many people wouldn't want to file the suit. They'd go, this is just a waste of time. The defendants also argue that even if timeliness claims aren't moot, those claims still fall when brought against the governor because they present a non-justiciable political question. So the governor is saying, I can refuse a FOIA request as a political act. <laughs> Moreover, the defendants claim that interpreting Chapter 22 to permit timeliness claims would infringe on the governor's executive privilege. <laughs> oh, the plaintiffs resisted. They argued that the case was not moot because the defendants had not provided all the requested records. Rather, the defendants had redacted and withheld several requested records under claims of confidentiality, even though the time to withhold documents had long since passed. Moreover, the plaintiffs claimed that even with regard to documents that had already been produced, they could still pursue claims for unlawful delay. And by the way, this is an interesting argument because the governor's office is saying, oh, by the way, some of the requests we didn't respond to because the material is privileged. But apparently they raised that on appeal, or at least in court. And if they send over a records request for confidential information, you send back the response immediately saying, cuts confidential. And at least the argument looks better then when you get to court and say, oh, I'm sorry, that's confidential. Why didn't you raise that earlier? The district court denied defendants' motions, and then the defendants then sought an interlocutory review. So this court will review this entire thing on its merits. And it says, we begin with the claims at the center of the plaintiff's original petition, namely claims that the defendant had failed to produce the records that the plaintiffs had requested. As explained, circumstances have changed, as the plaintiffs acknowledge, defendants have now produced many of the records. And so the defendants believe that any claims about production are now moot. On this issue, we generally agree with the defendants. One familiar principle of judicial restraint is that courts do not decide cases when the underlying controversy is moot. If an appeal no longer presents a justiciable controversy, the appeal is ordinarily deemed moot, etc., etc. We believe that most of the claims concerning production of already produced records are now moot. They are moot because in order to produce already produced records would have no force or effect in the underlying controversy. Also, we conclude that no mootness exception should apply. We've recognized an exception to the general rule exists where matters of public importance are presented and the problem is likely to recur. But we do not worry defendants will withhold the already produced documents. As they're pointing out that they can't really say that we're going to order you to produce documents you've already produced. But it says we add two caveats. First, and most broadly, we do not believe mootness applies to any of the plaintiff's other claims. Although mootness prevents the issuance of a court order to produce the documents, mootness would not bar any other relief under the Act, such as attorney fees incurred in filing suit to compel production. And that, of course, is one of the things that some people would do and go, oh, if we force them to sue us, they'll have to incur attorney fees. Well, if you force them to sue you and they incur attorney fees, you got to pay them. Second, and more particularly, we emphasize that our findings of mootness only apply to records that have been produced without redaction. It is undisputed that the defendants have withheld or redacted some requested records based on claims of confidentiality. Parties agree that the district court must still determine whether the defendant must produce these records in unredacted form. We entrust those issues to the district court. We believe it is appropriate to mention, though, that one aspect of a dispute appears to have been resolved in their district court filings. The plaintiffs drew attention to Section 22.84D, which states, Good faith, reasonable delay by a lawful custodian in permitting the examination and copying of a government record is not a violation of this chapter if the purpose of the delay is any of the following, and that is to determine whether a confidential record should be available, etc., etc., Plaintiffs asserted that Section 2284D imposes a 20-day deadline before which defendants were obligated to raise any claim of confidentiality. Plaintiffs also suggested because the defendants' January 22 assertions of confidentiality occurred clearly outside of the 20-day time frame, 
the defendants had waived the ability to withhold and redact those records. On appeal, the defendants ask us to hold that no such waiver could have occurred. The defendants note that nothing in Chapter 22 provides or even suggests that the consequence for failing to respond on time would be to make an otherwise confidential document public. That interpretation would be absurd, the defendants contend, and would eviscerate the many confidentiality protections provided by Iowa law. In their response brief, the plaintiffs clarify their position on this issue, maintaining that the defendants' failure to assert their confidentiality claims in a timely manner is a further instance of the defendants' untimeliness in responding to open records requests and therefore a violation of Chapter 22. But plaintiffs clarify that this untimeliness does not mean that otherwise confidential records must be produced. Plaintiffs further clarify they do not seek disclosure of records which are determined to be properly designated as confidential. So what they're saying is, we're just saying that they got to produce the stuff and produce it, let the district court judge look at it and decide whether it should stay confidential or not. But now on the delay claims, and this is the meat of this case, can the plaintiffs pursue claims that the defendants violated Chapter 22 through delays in responding to the plaintiffs' open record requests? With some qualifications, we believe the answer is yes. And keep in mind, this is the Supreme Court of Iowa being very, very modest when they say we believe the answer is yes. When they say the answer is yes, the answer is yes. General principles. Iowa's Open Records Act is codified in Iowa Code, Chapter 22. It's the policy that free and open examination of public records is generally in the public interest, even though such examination may cause inconvenience or embarrassment to public officials or others. The act gives every person a right to examine, copy, and publish a public record. Section 22.1 defines public record to include all records, documents, and other information of or belonging to the state or any of its branches or departments. But Section 22.7 deems certain documents like medical records or school records to be confidential and therefore generally protected from disclosure. Iowans may exercise their rights under the Act by requesting records from a records lawful custodian. A request can be made in person, in writing, by telephone, or by electronic means, i.e. email. The lawful custodian is the government body currently in physical possession of the public record. Each government body must delegate someone to do these things and so on. If a request is refused, an aggrieved person may seek judicial enforcement of the requirements of the Act in an action brought against the lawful custodian and any other persons who would be appropriate defendants under the circumstances. And then the Act even spells out a trial process. So the law makes clear a plaintiff's burden is to demonstrate three elements. That the defendant is subject to the requirements of the Act, that the records in question are government records, and that the defendant refused to make those government records available for examination. Then the burden shifts to the defendant to demonstrate compliance with these requirements. Question here in this particular case is whether Chapter 22 allows a plaintiff to sue when there is no express refusal, but the defendant fails to produce the records for an extended period of time. To find the answer, we must look to the text of the statute, the words chosen by the legislature, and so on. Uh, The law makes it clear that when, as here, a defendant is subject to the act and the records sought are government records, The plaintiff's only burden is to demonstrate the defendant refused to make those government records available. The crucial word, then, is refused. We must determine its ordinary and fair meaning. Of course, the ordinary and fair meaning of refusal can include an explicit refusal, but refusal can also be implied. The idea of a silent refusal is not foreign to English speakers, and dictionaries confirm that a refusal can either be stated or shown. And they actually looked to Webster's Third New International Dictionary, unabridged edition, 2002. So they actually have a whole lot of information here where they cite that and other dictionaries. We conclude that a defendant may refuse either by stating a refusal or showing that it won't produce records. And we believe this second kind of refusal, an implied or silent refusal, can be shown through an unreasonable delay in producing records. So what they're getting at here is, functionally, it is the same thing. So that if they are told you must produce these records, and they simply don't produce them, and time goes by, and they should have produced them, and they didn't, well, then that's a violation of the statute. And as I pointed out before, 
there's a situation that occurs where somebody will say, I want you to do something. Other side says, ain't going to do it. So somebody files a lawsuit. Let's assume there's a situation where a lawsuit would be appropriate. Then the person does it. And then they go into court at the first hearing and say, Your Honor, we've already done what they've accused us of not doing. We've already done it. Why'd they file the lawsuit? Judge will look at them and go, why'd you file the lawsuit? Well, Your Honor, they didn't do it until we sued them. Now, there are situations where that lawsuit might be what they call moot, meaningless, pointless. The court might just dismiss it. So let's suppose that you and I have a, uh, just a contract whereby I owe you $1,000 cash. I owe you $1,000 money. Okay, I owe you $1,000. <laughs> I'm specifying that we're talking simply about money. We're not talking about anything else. It's simply money. It's $1,000. It's a lawful debt. I owe you $1,000. Okay? You file the lawsuit against me, and I go, oh, this person's serious, and I cut you a check for $1,000. You take it, cash it, the check is good, you got $1,000. There's a good chance in most states you've got to drop that lawsuit now. And yeah, you had to waste a couple bucks filing the lawsuit on the filing fee. If you hired an attorney, you may have wasted some money there also. But that's because of the way the American rule works in America. And that is that most parties have got to bear their own attorney fees and costs of going to court. Now, if there's a fee-shifting statute, I encountered this many, many times with the Consumer Protection Act back when that was a good law, because the Consumer Protection Act said if somebody does this, that, or the other thing, they owe you damages plus attorney fees and court costs if you prevail. So I'd file a lawsuit against somebody, and they'd cough up immediately what they owed. There you go, you've been made whole. And I'd talk to my client about it. My client would go, yeah, but what about your attorney fees? And I'd say, well, technically, they owe you those too. And I can think of some very, very good examples. I, I, I can think of one that comes to mind. And it was the one where I had a person who ordered a car and bought a car off the internet, which is, of course, violating one of my other rules, but bought a car off the internet after seeing 45 photographs of it, literally 45 photographs, or more than 40. I know it was in the 40s. And uh, they shipped them a different vehicle. No question, it's a different vehicle. So 45 photographs of vehicle A, and they ship them vehicle B. And the seller is in another state far, far away and probably thought they could get away with it. And the vehicle shows up. It's, it's the same make and model, but it's a different car. And we know that because of the damage to it. So we tried negotiating with them, and they said, no, what are you going to do about it? So we sued them. And an attorney from Michigan, called me and said, I represent this, uh, this company out of state, and I understand you've sued them. I said, yeah. He goes, we'll refund your client's money right now, every penny of it, and we'll pay to have that car shipped back to where it came from. I said, okay, and attorney fees and court costs. And the guy goes, excuse me? Go, attorney fees and court costs. And he goes, why? You haven't done anything yet. I go, well, we filed a complaint. How do you think you found out about the case? Didn't somebody call you up because they're being sued? And he goes, yeah, but the lawsuit just got filed. And I said, oh, we're not asking for like a million dollars in a ham sandwich. I, 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 we, but we want our attorney fees. I mean, we, we have a filing fee, right? We paid money to file this case. So there's a filing fee. My client never drove the car. They're getting the car back in exact condition they shipped it to us in. So I go, you can't make an argument for use of the vehicle. No miles are put in the car. Never, never, never even played it. So... You're going to get your vehicle back, but you got to pay our attorney fees and court costs. And the guy goes, well, yeah, I, I don't think we should pay that. I said, well, you need to talk to your client. So the guy called me back and he goes, well, I, I told my client that I don't think we should pay it. I said, well, here's the problem. I'll see you in court. And uh, when we go to court, I'm going to cite the following cases. And I just rattled off a whole bunch of cases. I go, go look those up. Because occasionally I'd run into people who hadn't dealt with that law before. And the law had a fee-shifting statute that said, if you prevail... Get your attorney fees and court costs. And I actually had one or two cases with a stubborn defendant who refused to pay until after a jury trial. And then finally they said, oh, fine. Jury returned a verdict of this. Here's a check. And said, da, 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 da. We're going to have a hearing on my attorney fees and court costs now. I've actually had attorney fees and court costs that were larger than the verdict rendered by the jury. The jury came back and said, we give the plaintiff this much money. Then we go to court, have a hearing on my attorney fees and court costs, and it turns out that I had incurred costs that were greater than that verdict. And everybody on the other side starts screaming and yelling, that's so unfair. I'm sorry, 
You could have cut my client a check on day one before the lawsuit was filed. I'm talking about back when my client first called you and said, hey, this is wrong. I want my money back. But you didn't do that. And so by forcing a year and a half of litigation, like 10 court appearances before we even had the trial, now you expect my client to just accept this verdict and what, pay me out of her pocket? She won't be made whole then. So fee-shifting statutes can do that. So that's one point that's worth noting here. But even without a fee-shifting statute, simply forcing someone to file the action and then complying would create a problem if the courts would allow that to happen. Because every single government agency out there would just go, oh, we do not have to respond until we're sued. So when they send you the FOIA request, throw it away. When they serve you with the complaint, open it up, see what they want, and send them what they want. And among other things, the courts and the judges would hate that. But obviously, that's not what the law was intended to do. So the law was being eh, probably ignored at first. And then when push came to shove, they decided to raise this argument in the Supreme Court of Iowa. (laughs) And the Supreme Court of Iowa says, yes, if you delay your response unreasonably, they can sue you for that. And so we'll see what happens. So it's been sent back down to the lower court for further proceedings. And depending on how that works out, I might do a follow-up. We'll see. But it's the case of Belen versus the governor in the Supreme Court of Iowa. Questions or comments, put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. Happiness is having a large, loving, close-knit family in another city.